Welcome back to the Intel Extreme Masters here in Katowice. We're halfway through the best of one group stage right now, and we're going to bring you next Kongdu Monster versus Unicorns of Love. Now, gentlemen, I have replaced another analyst once more, getting through them as quickly as ever today, and it's going to be Vedius, my longtime friend from the UK scene. We go back a very, very long way, so it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, sir. I'm excited to talk a little bit about the Unicorns of Love, the European representative. We've already seen one today. Let's see how the next one does. So they're going against Condu Monster. Now, Kongdu Monster are 10th place in the LCK. We talked about the Rocks Tigers, who are 8th place. Kongdu Monster are 10th place. They are 1 and 7 right now in their current split record. They're going up against Unicorns of Love, who have arguably looked one of the strongest teams in Europe next to G2. Where are we rating this game? Is this, is this a one-sided affair, or is it because it's LCK, because it's almost like a hyperbolic time chamber of a region that we're going to see something a little bit closer? I mean, it's starting to be more like the LCKs, the majors, and other regions seem to be minors, because if the eighth place team can do this well, like, these guys are good, right? Kongdu Monster is actually a team that shows a lot of promise, especially closing out games. They understand how to pressure their advantages, and that's one of the, like, you got to know how to win. And surprisingly, a lot of teams don't know how to do that well. They can just win off the mistakes of an opponent. Whereas when you can set it up yourself, that speaks volumes for your ability as a team. Well, uh, personally, I have to ever so slightly disagree because while I do think that there is potential for the Kongdu Monsters, I think their primary style is very much about scaling. They tend to do not very much in the early game. They tend to prioritize around the mid and late game. And I think that if you give a team like the Unicorns of Love the freedom to get to the 20-minute mark, then you're going to really suffer the wrath of the Unicorns of Love. <laughs> well, I don't want to delay too much because our teams are ready to walk out on stage. So please join me in welcoming the representatives from the LCK, Kongdu Monster, and one of Europe's favorite favorite teams, it's Unicorns of Love. So the teams are taking the stage. And while we're at it, make sure you check out the Score eSports to get all of your league coverage, your news, your scores, and even tips and guides on how to do well on Summoner's Rift. Remember to check out the Score eSports at thescoreesports.com, on the iOS app and Android app too. And they also have a YouTube page if that is your designated media source. So go and check out the Score eSports. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to start with Kongdu Monster. You talked earlier about potentially not as much individual skill with the players, but their team meshing is, is promising. Are there players that we want to look out for on Kong Team Monster, though, Crumbs? Oh, it's Punch, the jungler, right? The aggressive moves, the meta favorites junglers right now, they are dictating the paces of the games that we've seen time and time again. And this guy has the ability to do a lot of a lot of carries. He's had a great champion pool, which is one of the key things for this current meta. The elites that we have seen Korean players play, even H2K kind of try to dabble in, not so convincingly, but they understand pressure very well. Where to be at the right time, which is one of the most cherished things to play as a jungler in the LCK right now. And that kind of play style is very suited towards a stage of the game where lanes are still going in the laning phase. But when it comes down to just team fight and getting caught out of position and being victims of engages that are forced, which are very good traits of the Unicorns of Love, I think that the Kongdu monsters can fall flat and be a little sporadic and just all over the place. For me, I'm lo actually looking down at the AD carry position for Essol. I think that he is a very strong individual, especially when you look at his team fighting. I think that he's uh, fairly promising. I think his laning phase could do with a bit of work, but if they're able to get through it, I think that it'll be exciting to see how these two teams match up when you get to those team fighting stages. And let's now reflect onto their opposition. Vedius, you will be very, very familiar with Unicorns of Love by now. I know, Crumbs, you've also done huge amounts of research into these guys over the course of this split, too. Who from the Unicorns of Love is the standout player? And let's not let's talk, not talk about Romain, because <laughs> he's almost like the sixth player that's kind of the standout guy. But yeah, I mean, who from Unicorns of Love really are we looking to keep an eye on now? The one player that uh, I personally think you always need to keep your eye on is Hillisang, because he is a massive playmaker on the Unicorns of Love. He's a big facilitator in a lot of how all of their mid-game team fights start. When you look back in their game against G2, his, ha his ability to play Tom Kench 
is just out of this world. And I think that he will be a big part of what enables them to get these mid-game fights that they're so good. And I couldn't agree more with your statement about Healy saying, I mean, the gonads on this guy, even though <laughs> Thresh plays, like you would not expect Thresh's to flash and engage on five people, but he pulls it off. And that kind of aggression is so unprecedented that it's difficult for a team to react and be used to such a decisive just, we're going in, that's it. And when you start thinking less on the champions that you have and just more like, we're all here, we can do this if we all actually back each other up for it and the engage works like that, it creates a new dynamic that the opponent has to play against that is really exciting. I think that's what's part of the thrill of watching the Unicorns of Love. Absolutely. And also, you guys were chatting to me previously just about the difference that we might see in terms of stylistic closing out a game, for instance, between H2K and Unicorns of Love. Are we expecting a lot more dominance from Unicorns of Love? Are they going to take a lead and run with it and completely close the game out? Well, typically what you see from the Unicorns is that once they get a lead, they know exactly what to do with it. They're really good at being able to force a lot of fights around the map, and it really kicks off at around the 25-minute mark, where they typically have fairly slow early game uh, presence. Zerse is a jungler that tends to play more scaling things like Ivern, even Rumble. He's brought Zack out a few times. Like, he's not really about the early game aggression, which is why you don't see a lot of early game snowballs from them. But once they do get a lead, they just suddenly click. They all work really well together and they all follow a single call, which is something that has been a really big trait for the Unicorns of Love uh, throughout this split so far. You, you, you're completely in agreement there, Crumbs. Well, yeah, you know, I've been watching EULCS just taking Verius' word for word verbatim <laughs> as to what unicorns have to say. So, but, like, this team is very exciting to watch because of that kind of moment where it clicks, where the unicorns just start getting the ball rolling, and it's difficult to prepare against that, where, you, where the game is in a lull in the beginning because of the champion select that they have. Again, the junglers right now, the ones that Xerzi's favoring are less of the early game and more on the scaling side. Even the rumble jungles, I mean, yeah. like when the time comes to just pull the trigger, you have a little bit more downtime in between your fights because you rely more on your ultimate, but the fact that they make the fights so effective and around objectives that, rev that actually get them something out of it makes that snowball that much more effective because you have more people there, you can get more. If you're prepped beforehand, before the laning, or out of the laning phase, the reward is much greater. I think the biggest concern for the Unicorns of Love in this game in particular is this best of one. Now, we've mentioned it a couple times throughout the day, but when you look at their set throughout the, the U split so far, sometimes it takes them a little while to get going. Sometimes in the early game, they're just a little bit too passive, and they make a couple of really silly mistakes that you wouldn't expect from them, especially when you look back at their game versus G2. They had like a pushing lane in the bottom, and they just conceded it all entirely. I mean, and I think that in terms of a best of one, that could be a window for Kongdu if they can just get advantage of the fact that maybe Unicorns are a little bit slow to start. Sure, they're slow to start, but I really don't want to be going into this not selling Kongdu. Like, I think that this team does have potential to go far in this tournament. Like, we really have to shed away the idea that, sure, they're not in a good spot within the LCK. But that's but within that, the LCK, right? Exactly. <laughs> like, and you don't want to just paint the LCK as these gods, but we want to give the credit to these players themselves, right? They have to practice against teams that are better than Unicorns of Love. Undoubtedly, they have to play this. They are constantly in this environment, so they know how to play against teams that might make mistakes that aren't typically seen or easy to exploit within their own region. So they have knowledge that will be applicable in this matchup to succeed. And we talked about it in our first game of the day. We said, is an 8th to 10th place LCK team comparable to a mid-tier EU team just because of the level of competition in the LCK? I don't think anyone out there is going to deny that LCK has the highest level of sure. League of Legends competition in the world. And when you're going 1-7 and seven versus teams like SKT, KT Rolster, you know, all, all those kind of teams that you know are going to just dominate whoever they play in the world, I mean, SKT have shown that time and time again. Is Kongdu Monster just playing against opposition that is way beyond them? And when realistically, when they go up against the likes of UOL or G2, they're on even pegging? Or are we expecting something different there? So the, the thing is, like, while I definitely think that's true for Korean teams, you are in an environment which is much difficult than you would argue for other regions. I think that, one, a lot of people are underestimating Europe, uh, largely because of our last year's international performance, which I think is justified. Yeah. But I also think that when you look at how Kong do play, they just straight up make a lot of bad decisions. They make a lot of individual mistakes that I think will be readily punished. And I also think that as a play style, they 
often pick more scaling compositions, which against Unicorns of Love, you're going to give them a style that they like, where you don't do anything to them in the early game, and then come the mid, they're just going to out team Okay, fight. but if you saw the Rox Tigers, the Rox Tigers mistakes that they kept making in the LCK were so abysmal that none of them really showed in this matchup that we saw earlier against M19. So the team clearly shaped, sharpened things up for this matchup. I expect Kongdu to do the same. We're straight into picks and bans here. Unicorns of Love versus Kongdu. The first game from our Group B set, by the way. We have moved through Group A now. We know what our winner's bracket final is going to be later on. That's going to be Rox versus H2K. But for now, Unicorns of Love and Kongdu. Bans coming out. Nothing out of the ordinary thus far. Maokai making it onto the first ban rotation too, as well as LeBlanc and Jace. Fun fact, previous two games, Red Side has won both games. Kongdu's on Red Side. <laughs> so statistically, <laughs> statistically, <we're looking> <laughs> so, so, when, so when I come to ask you predictions, you're going to say statistically Kongdu wins because of Red Side. No, we have a we have a break before predictions. <laughs> <laughs> but um, something interesting that I find that Kongdu do a lot is they actually put a lot of investment onto banning away the Malzahar. Now, uh, with the changes to Ooh. Rengar, I, I was going to mention that they might actually choose to leave it open, especially against a player like Zerse, who, while he has bring it out, may not be as comfortable for him. But it looks like that their focus is a little bit elsewhere. Interestingly, this is a complete mirroring of what we saw from previous uh, Rox Tigers. They did not give that much of a, you know, a care about Ivan. This time, Kongdu say, no, actually, we are not comfortable with Ivan. You know, he's gone. Well, you have to remember that Zerste was the guy that brought Ivan yeah, to yeah, Europe. Yeah. He's, the, <laughs> the OG. he's the OG uh, Ivan player. So he, he definitely has a lot of experience, but it looks like for you, well, they've got a pretty safe start to the matchup. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually saw some early focus on Shen and Ryze, something that the Unicorns have had a lot of success on throughout the We haven't seen Ryze yet at all. You know, he's made it through. I think he's not been banned in either game, and neither team has decided to pick him up. But Graves gets that locked in here when to punch. It gets exciting. Graves is the number one judge right now just so much damage as we say all the time death is the greatest CC of them all and when you <laughs> pair it with a Sivir you know that this team will al already they have scaling on their side yeah. they're gonna build a team comp around the utility for these two picks most likely a tank in the top side and more utility focus as opposed to damage in the support maybe a Karma Karma Sivir being a super common bottom lane yeah. and it, it looks like UOL will have to kind of take that advantage for the early game a little bit because you mentioned that they do like to play a scaling for Kongdu side, but this it's a Sivir. Like I mean, you don't beat Sivir. Like well, Sivir. <laughs> I mean, that's definitely true, but there's definitely a big window in the early game that yeah, you can yeah. look to punish. I mean, uh, this Which is where the UOL does not play. This is where you're going to be see yeah. Unicorns of Love tested, though, right? Because they've been praised so much for their team fighting, and now they're going up against the composition, which is already heading towards team fighting. But the Unicorns of Love putting high value on the Shen once again, something that they have done a lot in the past. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Ukongu to actually ban away the Rise. I think that if you've done your research, it's something you have to take Exile off yeah. because it is one of his comfort picks. What, one of the major things that we were talking about pre, you know, IEM totally is that a lot of people are having debate. Exiles may be one of the best mid laners in Europe right now. A lot of people were, were throwing that out there as, as, a, as a statement. And he's drawn a lot of attention to himself as an incredibly skilled player. Well, speaking of Vedis's point on Rise, he was actually the first guy to bring out Rise as well. When he got that rework with the Realm Work last year, he was the one that said, you know what, I think this champion is good. I'm going to take a risk on it. Speaking to the creativity that this team has, they bring it out. It's all of a sudden one of the most popular picks in the mid lane. And it would make a lot of sense considering the short range carries that Kongdu has at their side of Renekton. It doesn't do a whole lot dealing with yeah. the short range and just incredible lockdown and burst. A lot of people that won't have been watching League of Legends competitively recently might look at the Renekton and say, holy moly, there's a Renekton in this game. Uh, why, why are we seeing Renekton come back in here? What, what is it that he does specifically? And especially LCK teams seem to be favoring it as well. Well, he has a lot of pushing power in the top lane. You're always going to auto-push that lane, which means that it gives a bit of freedom towards your jungler if he wants to try and play aggressively into the enemy's half. Uh, he also just puts Shen down, makes it difficult for him to make that TP play. If he goes to the bottom side of the map, that Renekton's going to be able to take that turret, and he naturally has a little bit more teamfight impact. And the fact that Kongdu have rounded or their main bulk of the composition with an Orianna implies that I think Kongdu are looking to teamfight crumbs. <laughs> yeah, and and, but Ryze gets locked in here. Yeah, of course. You, you really wouldn't expect any other pick. And when you have Ryze, you have to add on top of the fact he's going to have Seraph shield. You're going to have the Shen shield. You're going to have his own shield. He's going to be very tough to kill. And the short, like, he is just going to be, if they put all the shields on him, this is going to be a very deadly pick. And the Thresham Hillisang is going to make him even harder because of the Lantern. I, if, I, if there's one pick that I think Hillisang is known for, 
it's this. Oh, Except for he hasn't locked it in because he's gone for Zyra instead. So all of that hype for absolutely nothing. Well, I actually think that this is better for him uh, because the likelihood of Kongdu going for something like a Karma would have made that laning phase horrible for Hillis Lang. It would have meant that he couldn't have roamed around the map and had those sort of playmaking power. Now the fact that Unicorns are playing a little bit more towards the bottom lane, I think opens up a few more opportunities. Sure. They, they have the pushing potential with a Varus Zyra. And if they lock in a Tom Kench for Kongdu, you're going to have a little bit more of an advantage in the ball. Well, the Zyra also has a tremendous team fighting element. When you have Sivir, you're expecting a team fight, but remember that the range from Graves and Sivir are their biggest weaknesses. And the fact that they have to run through the massive range of the Strangled Thorns, it makes it really difficult to team fight through that area. The plants, they don't really have any ways of dealing with it. That zoning potential will make the team fights. Honestly, they could very easily go in the favor of UOL right now. They have so much zone and so much burst in CC that if Kongdu isn't careful and gets popped right away, like UOL could easily take this. So, gents, I'm going to press you. I haven't done them this far, but Andy did recommend to me that maybe I should. Predictions. Mm -hmm. I, I have actually completely missed a golden opportunity here. Crumb's the prophet, and I haven't even tested him <laughs> on his predictions just yet. So, guys, I will push you here based on that draft phase, based on what we know of these two teams. Who are you expecting to come out on top on this best of one? Uh, I do think that Unicorns of Love will come out ahead in this one. I really enjoy their draft. I think they got picks that they're comfortable with that are really suited to the meta. And even though Kongdu's picks are quite strong as well. I just find that the comfort for the Unicorns is better. I'm going to have to agree with Crumbs. I think that they've drafted a composition that suits them nicely. I think they're going to be forcing fights all over the map and you should expect to see Exile to pop off. Wonderful. Well, we're going to be going into a cast from a new face. A lot of you won't have seen Munchables and he's joined by Papa Smithy. After the break, we'll be right into the game.
Welcome everybody to the Caster Desk once more here at the Intel Extreme Masters. My name is Munchables and I'm joined by the beautiful Papa Smithy. And now we've already heard what the analysts think of this game, but you are the resident Korean expert. How do you think Kongdo are going to go here up against UOL? It's a really intriguing one. Uh, when I saw the list of matches coming out in the group stages, this was the one I thought was really going to leap off the page in terms of contrasting styles, a real test for Kongdo Monster, yeah. who the analysts, I think, put it clearest. Very difficult region for them to succeed. They looked good at IEM Gyeonggi, but outmatched in just terms of individual skill in most roles. Seoul's one of the better AD carries in Korea, but Deft, Pawn, yeah, you start naming yeah. people. So Deft, well, not Pawn, Deft Prey, <laughs> and uh, Bang, and you start naming these people, and it gets very difficult for him. So it is really intriguing how they'll stack up. I like the draft from Kongdu, but as the analyst pointed out, it's extreme comfort for UL. So the skepticism for Kongdu here is a lot of these picks, they have a little bit of competitive experience on, not a massive amount. This is ultimate comfort for the European yep. team. So even though as we get into it, there's going to be some scenarios where it's kind of a lot of if statements, what if statements. If they can attack their pushing lanes, get the Graves ahead, which has been one of the main strategies for Kongdu this season, they could go really far in this game. If it kind of gets to mid game and it's even, it feels like Unicorns of Love have the tools to really push it and take yeah. the game. And I mean, you already mentioned that this kind of, uh, how does Europe stack up against the bottom side of the Korean table? Like this is our first game where we actually are going to see that really come into effect. And we're actually going to see how the Europeans can stack up. I believe the players are just getting onto the Rift now. So we should be able to hop into game. So here we go. First game of the day. Well, Third game of the day, in fact, I can't count, but it is Kongdu Monster up against the Unicorns of Love. And we're going to find out how the second team in Europe is going to be stacked up against one of the very much lower tier teams over in Korea. It's one of those narratives that's like really tricky because EU comes in the big favorites as they should given that standing. Unicorns previous to the G2 loss were really flying super high. And it's one of those things where the expectations are there for Europe and it's that trap game where if they lose to 10th place, they'll never hear the end of it. Yeah. It'll be one of those things that will reverberate. And if they win, it's like, well, they should have won. They're the second, third place team in it's Europe. It's a lose-lose right? lose situation for them. There's, uh... But it's also a best of one. And that's kind of the excitement here. And we come back to the draft from Kongdu. Some of the things they've done, I think, are really smart. So one of the things I want to talk and focus on is that they've gone for the Renekton versus Shen, which early game champion versus late game champion. Chachi, super, super experienced on the Shen, Roach so not, not so much on the Renekton, but it gives an early pushing advantage. You know, there's not going to be a TM at level one. Yep. Renekton's going to be able to push in. Maybe Kongdu Monster's strong. only strategy that has worked in LCK is invading strongly with the Graves, being able to get in there, get in the enemy jungler's face, get Punch a big lead, and allow Punch to show what he showed in Challenger and IEM Gyeonggi, but what he has only shown very much on Graves in the LCK. So pushing advantage in top, around level seven, eight, nine, pushing advantage in mid. They can get punch ahead, get a snowball. Maybe this game can be really be set up in the mid game, but there's a lot of what ifs in that statement. Already That's a, a lot, lot of, of aggression down in this bottom lane. Hillisang forced to flash. Strong start from Kongdu here. Already showing their dominance in this bottom lane. And you'd think they would be perfectly experienced playing against the Tom Kench, a much bigger pick in Europe than it has been over in Korea, but disrespecting level from one from Tom Kench. Bit of nerves, you'd have to say, yep. from the Unicorns of Love bot lane, but it's only a flash to begin with. Yeah, two summoners for one. It's the flash and the summoner heal, whereas the exhaust came out from Kruger just to start that fight off. Now we are going to have a bit of a pause. Maybe uh, some players <laughs> reeling from the level one action there, but nothing too ridiculous coming out. Just that little bit of a trade down in the bottom lane. Do you think the, the lack of flash on Hillasan could come into play? Do you think we could see um, Punch come down towards that bottom lane and try and capitalize on that? I mean, very simple. Very simple. That very simply, whenever you lose a summoner like that, it's going to be obviously a pretty big issue, specifically against Tom Kench, who has a surprisingly good all-in with be able to be with the ability to devour at level two. So Hellasang will have to be very defensively positioned. Usually in a lane like Varus Zyra, Zyra is just looking for Q harass. Uh, we're on patch 7.3, so the plants don't auto lock, so it's much more requirement to actually hit your Q mm -hmm. onto the enemy to guarantee the trades. So not going to be able to walk up as far this time out. So it's going to have to be a bit more defensive, less harass. You get through the lane as Sivra Tom Kench. This is very much a sustained lane for Kongdu Monster. Both these supports, in the, this, both these champions in the late game will be very strong. Sire and Tom Kench in different ways. But getting Sivra through a sustaining matchup against Varus, that's not fantastic for the Sivra, but gets better as you get on the game. 
Uh, the Zyra pick, especially on Hillisang, we already seen him kind of overextend almost on that pick. He hasn't played this in the EU LCS at all this entire split. Do you think this is a symptom of that? Or do you think it was maybe just a bit of an unfortunate play? Maybe maybe stage jitters. This is their first game of the entire tournament. I think that's a good point to bring up, the fact that he hasn't been as familiar on a champion. He's surely put in plenty of games in solo queue and scrim. I think he was kind of necessitated to take Zyra in this game. It's not the priority of Zyra being a tier one support, but so much as Renekton, Graves, Tom Kench are all gonna be in 300 or less range diving in the fight. And Strangle Thorns is very important as a team fight reset for Unicorns of Love. So it's less about picking for power and more about just needing the Strangle Thorns and disengage that Zyra can provide later. Now, speaking of picking for power, already hefty trades going away in the mid lane, and I want to touch on the Rise pick coming out from Exile, because this is a pick that both of these mid laners have heavily prioritized in their region specifically, but obviously UL have had a lot of success, and a lot of it has revolved around Exile. And as you say, it's a big pick. The first pick of the second round was Orianna, which leapt off the page is a bit strange. Sure, Ori is a strong pick, but not usually as the blind pick mid laner. It seems that Kongdu expected the Rise, and Rise in some ways counterpicked himself. As this lane goes on, Orianna gets better and better into Rise, level seven to nine especially, and then going on, and in team fights, he's propping up in shorter range. Orianna can punish with the ball, so it is a self counterpick, but it's gonna evolve into a 1-3-1 from Unicorns of Love if they don't fall behind early. And speaking of falling behind early, Xerxes is up around top. Yeah, so looking for a gank. Visit Chachi going for the extended trade here. Roach will get taunted up, gets his slice Misses and the dies though, and the flash over the wall will pull himself to safety. Missed the bowler there, Zerx. I don't even know if Roach needed to invest into the flash over, but showed massive respect in that situation. Doesn't want to start anything off. Punch was already Sin contesting the Raptors. He's looking for a wraparound. They know Zyra doesn't have flash. Yeah, and I mean, they just saw Zerx towards the top side of the map. This could be a good opportunity. Ruger incredibly low though. That might be enough to just deter this gank entirely. Punch is going to be recalling. And it looks like no action down on this bottom side for now. It was a big misplay from Gruga. He could have flash exhaust and they would have got the all in to Zyra. Didn't have flash up. The pathing was natural for Graves to walk up, but he tried to be cute and just walk up. Took trade damage. And by the time he was down to 200 health with no gray skin, it was the most suspicious thing ever if he ever walked up again. So yeah. they, they lose an opportunity and Punch's time is wasted where he could have been farming or could have been impacting another map. So slight misplay from Guga on that game. Yeah, there's, there's that moment where you can read your opponents that was like that's not just reading that's holding that's like off him, a sign he's shouting at them i'm coming for you and uh, they realize exactly what's going on but already we're seeing a lot of pressure coming out from both junglers Zerxai on that rengar going for oh, oh exile so low that one more auto would do it edge doesn't want to flash for the kill though 60 hp the flash auto is does yeah. really Deceptive amounts of damage didn't put his confidence in it, but still will get Exile out of lanes. That's a small victory in itself. Especially with the clockwork windup, I feel like one more auto would have got it. And the defensive summoner exhaust, it wouldn't have gone down in time. And if it's a best of three in the LCK, a best of five, you'd probably go for that flash. But as a best of one, that has massive implications on the international scene. This time, yep. Kongdu, who sure played an international tournament, but they were in Korea, so very much comfort before and after the matches. Understandable too. Take a step back, but it's the sort of thing where in the VOD review, if you don't go on to win this game, like, man, this game could have changed if there was a solo kill in mid lane five, six minutes in. Yeah, I mean, most most games will be fairly heavily decided if there's a solo kill so early on, it generally shows a dominant player. But I want to touch back on towards this bottom lane, looking at the Civer pick specifically. Now, obviously, it was very heavily prioritized during the champion select. And as you had said earlier in the cast, it's something that stands out quite a bit. Are we expecting to see a lot out of Soul because of this pick? Are they relying heavily on this pick in this game? I mean, they, they rely heavily on Soul as a player, so it kind of goes without being said whatever he locks in. But the reason why Sivis in a big resurgence is mostly because of this matchup we're seeing. Varus was left up. It was a very obvious first pick and happily taken from Unicorns of Love. It was Kramer from Afrika that showed or reminded people that Sivir actually gets through this lane. And against a lot of the other meta champions, Sivir has a really hard time. That's why she fell off in terms of pick rate against Varus. The big play style with Varus is that you try and get both harass onto the enemy champion and line wave clear with your Q. Hitting the Q on both is kind of the gold standard. Siv is able to walk up, prop the spell shield, stop the harass from coming in. And speaking of harass, Punch gets the blue buff steal. <laughs> Just 
No, no, like, not a single bit of sweat on his forehead there. Just slides over the wall, takes the buff, and just strolls away. And it's what we're seeing. Renekton pushed into top. Orianna already to push up into mid. And that does allow Punch to start the invasion. We've seen a Raptor. We see a blue buff steal. They're trying to play this confidence game, Kongdu. And they need to hit this window of timing when they're strongest. Because Renekton in the late game, it's an old meme. It's definitely not going to stand up to Shen. Yeah, and as importantly as well, Zerxe still wasn't level 6 at that point, so they can go in while Zerxe still doesn't have the ultimate and kind of punish him for picking a, a jungler that's so reliant on it. But there was no vision either, though, so they, they just were completely surprised to see Graves quick draw in. That was a big surprise there, so Invader's advantage certainly there for Kongdu Monster, and this game's gone pretty much as the draft would dictate, but there's been no solo kills, no lead, and now in bot lane. Here we go, though, Gruger is going to be locked up, has that grey health. We are going to see the Rengar jump in and just obliterate that health bar. First bot goes down, Soul is not long for the Rift. He drops as well, and it's two for the Unicorn. Super good target selection from the Unicorns of Love. They knew that they could get Gruger. That one was already in the bag, but they also aggressively pushed onto Soul, get the two kills down. Nice early double kill, and as you say, Vizitachi picks up the Shen ultimate, uses it so expertly on the first time. Comfort upon comfort on the Rift for Unicorns of Love, and if they can already end the bot lane laning phase, start the 1-3-1 game, they're going to be very happy as this could be a big investment from Kongdu. Teleport. Teleport from Roach. He's going to be looking to force the engage, already popping that Dominus, but we'll get rooted. Beautiful root from Hillisang. Chip damage coming through onto Punch as well. They're trying to finish this one. Flash from Roach. Big Triple ultimate. Triple Shockwave. Look at the damage coming through. Can they finish it? Only one kill onto Hillisang, but they get the kill. That's the important thing. They also don't lose the the turret, so it looks like a big investment. Now it's actually Kongdu turning onto the turret. Ryze could well warp in, walking into range now, but Guger trying to stop him from coming in. If they actually get the first brick or the first blood turret, this is, ends up being an advantage yep. trade because it's only one kill down for a massive burst of gold. Yeah, any, any amount of gold lead that UL had managed to gain has just been entirely negated and swung back into Kongdu's favor. Now 1,000 ahead. This game is certainly in their favor, and it's certainly them on the driving seat. Not many teams would have made that play where they invested Teleport. Oriana was already in position, but they go for what could have been multiple kills, but they get the bigger objective. They get the turret because Graves already walking up with a lot of AD, very strong at pushing, and they stop Unicorns from ending the laning phase on their turns. This looked like it was going to be massive for Unicorns. So this part perfectly played, and it's not really one team misplaying. It's more about celebrating the smart moves teams made. First, getting Soul as the bonus kill here was by no means guaranteed. And then like, okay, Unicorns going to get the turret, rise in the side lane. It's 1-3-1. One, one. It's the yep. Unicorn special. But the ward over by Punch. Teleport. And Edge has already been free farmed. He's in a good spot. And even though the disengage looked like it was going, they kept fishing because they knew one pick comes down, health bars goes down, they'll get the turret. Yeah, just look at that shockwave. On to three. All it takes is just a little bit of extra to finish off Hillisang. To be honest, it was almost unlucky that they don't get more than just Hillisang off the back of it. Beautiful shockwave, beautiful use of the ultimate. And honestly, Edge is impressing me so far in this series. If he can land shockwaves like that later in the game, that will be the game done and dusted. And it's just one of those games where as an analyst you smile, because both teams knew their limits. The double kill was Unicorns knowing their limits with the Shen, and then Kongdu making a play not many teams would go for. Not really their playbook in LCK. That was surprisingly decisive. And now they find themselves, again, inching ahead. Certainly not massively ahead, but inching ahead in a situation where they could have lost two members, a turret, and then Unicorns could have just played their normal game. So you say that's a play that they wouldn't usually go for uh, somewhere like in, in the LCK. Do you think this could be a confidence thing? That when they're in the LCK, they respect their opponents a lot harder. And here in Europe, they're not necessarily as afraid. It's really hard to get a read as Chains of Corruption has popped by the Devour on confidence. You know, I don't think they came in with too much expectation, Kongdu. I talked to their coach and I'm like, you're feeling good, you know? And Koreans can definitely be like, yep, we're gonna win it. You know, you see Mickey in pre-tournament pre interviews, so confident, I don't see any real enemies. But, you know, they seemed pretty grounded. They didn't really know what to expect, of course. Like all these teams, they were preparing for LCK opposition very recently and only pivoted towards IEM in the last few days. But it's just good to see them, not overawed by the situation, not overawed by being outside Korea and making decisive moves because there has been games where they kind of just meandered around and lost because they just missed their timing windows. They're looking for their timing windows in this game as Guga are looking for something but not finding it. Yeah, trying to find a way in there, but a little bit too late and can't find his target. Everyone starting to hover around towards this top side of the map now. 
as Xerxes does have his ultimate once again. We could see him try and force something. Exile. Shockwave onto Exile. It's a 1v1, but not for long. His visit actually will come in. Taunt lands. This will surely be a kill onto the mid lane, and nowhere for Edge to go. And Exile picks it up. Yeah, really nice turn there. Once again, using the Shen ultimate expertly. I really thought that Shen would be a contested pick or a ban away by Kongdu Monster, given how comfortable it is for Unicorn. They get a single pick. They're not going to be able to get the turret because Graves parts into mid and has good wave clear. We're looking very much at the turret race as the big story, because a single kill, sure, three yeah. to one looks good. If it's a soccer score line, you're feeling great, or football, we're in Europe. <laughs> but in the context of this game, Kongdu's still doing their job. Yeah. And it's going to be kind of the question of, Kongdu right now ahead in turrets. Can UOL obviously turn those kills into turrets? And can Kongdu continuously take these turrets if they are losing the fights, if they are losing the skirmishes repeatedly? Will they actually have the ability to keep on forcing objectives and taking the towers? Yeah, the 1 3 1 will be very powerful for the Unicorns of Love. Kongdu wants to have good team fighting, but Renekton in the ultra late game really doesn't do much AoE damage, even though he will invest into the Black Cleaver early and maybe even two damage items, Titanic Hydra a big favorite there. So their team fighting, I think, is pretty even between these teams. Maybe a slight advantage to Unicorns, specifically because the Zyra will deal with a lot of what Kongdu Monster want to do. And But the 1-3-1 one, one is, is something they should have in the bag. Shen gets to the point where he can shrug off the damage from the Renekton. So while it's a 400 gold lead, it needs to keep going. It needs to be Kongdu Monster keep improving on what has been a solid, if not spectacular, early game. And I think both teams at this point are comfortable, but itching for the next advantage they can actually push. Yeah, we are starting to see a couple of item spikes coming out here. Ghostblade just literally picked up by Samux. Over on the other side, Sol doesn't have his quite completed item just yet. He's gone for his upgraded boots, which will slow that down slightly. You've got Morello in the mid lane for Edge, though. And we've already seen that Edge can be a phenomenal player. Rod of Ages almost there for Exile, but again, still not quite there. So some of these players starting to hit their spikes. Some of them will be in the next few minutes. Do you think that's going to be an indicator of a lot of action to come here? I mean, the item spikes are a little bit more about scaling than in some other games. Rod of Ages, clearly a scaling item. Sivir is all about Essence Reaver into the second item being the big power spike. So again, the impact of items is going to be felt more around 22 minutes than it is at 15 minutes. To me, the biggest issue for Kongdu is they have Orianna and Sivir. And the reason why I say that is that Sivir parked in the mid lane. Wave clearing can extend games forever if you have, say, a Rise who can go into side lane. But they have Orianna who's kind of anchored to mid lane as well. So if the turrets in top and bot go down for Kongdu Monster, lane assignment becomes a lot more tricky unless you're just initiating fights. And the 1-3-1 one, one will be devastating. But for now, in a short map with no tur outer turrets down, things are comfortable on both sides. And the items, again, we're waiting for them to really come through. Yeah, Exile. I thought he might have been in a little bit trouble there. There was sort of a roaming death squad from Kongdu heading towards the mid lane. He is going to back away, though. And now we see Kongdu grouping up. They're looking to try and finish off this tower. You've already mentioned how they are, have a huge, huge priority on these objectives, trying to turn that into more. But it's not really a minion wave to work with. I mean, if you can get a vision advantage with specifically this comp, it doesn't matter if you don't have a massive minion wave. Because let's say you Abyssal Voyage under a turret with Graves and Sivir. Graves, one of the best turret takers, if you can get into melee range, especially get all three starts with the box shot, you do a lot of turret damage, and Sivra can auto attack and has an auto attack cancel that not many auto AD carries have, and you do 400, 500 burst damage instantly, back away. If you have the vision, you get to the next turret faster, get that 500 damage up top, and so I really like the rotational play we're seeing from Kongdu, because they just win out in these trades, unless they're trying to push into Varus. Yeah, Samux is going to be a huge thorn in Kongdu's side here, but Again, as you say, if they can just rinse and repeat that, kind of just get a quarter or a third of the tower damage each time and just keep on repeating that, they will slowly but surely eke out on that. And what they need to do that around the top side is cancelling out the control wards that we see two placed around blue buff and just to the left of the rise and kind of force Samex to be wave clearing for max range behind the turret rather than on the turret. If it's too safe because you're like, wait, where's everyone else at while I see only the Sivir pushing on, then suddenly Varus can't do his oppressive wave clear where there's really no counterplay to him killing the minions. You need the vision to be on your side, but pushing in for that, that's the trickier part that Kongdu haven't quite problem solved just yet. Yeah, UOL trying to be a little bit aggressive there, trying to push in for a pick, but not really able to find it. And that's kind of been the story of the last few minutes is UOL, yes, we mentioned it earlier, they 
got a few picks for themselves. But that was a while ago. Now it's been quite some time since UOL actually found something. But the gold difference has minimized as well. We're, we're basically looking at like four, five hundred gold between these two teams. But we're both veterans. We've watched Unicorns of Love's games, whether it was live or VODs. We know this is going to get super bloody. Unicorns are number one for kills or deaths, basically kill involvements in a game, but they do weirdly have a lull around 10 to 25 minutes when not a lot happens. And then you look at their company, they're like, initiation CC, initiation CC, everyone can initiate. The fights will come. So we're very much in that misleading point where we're waiting for the action to take the next tick. But both teams are farming. We're waiting for some for a real theater of battle. And that's the thing is after 25 minutes, Baron's a theater of battle. A second, third Drake, if it's Infernal's a theater of battle. And that's where Unicorn's comp can really shine. For now, Renekton's pushing in bot. Sivir's pushing in top. They're not quite getting the objectives like the turrets, but everything's standard. Just kind of brace yourself, yeah. bunch of because we're getting exciting soon. Hillisank flashing away from a shockwave there. Edge trying to force the issue, trying to make these battles come sooner. He's bored of waiting as well. But not going to find anything just yet. He's going to be happy burning that flash, though. The other side so far doing an okay job. Roach now finding off Zerk. Say that is going to be the stand United. Can Vizzy get the stun? No, he can't. Taunt doesn't go through. Vizzy Chachi just going to have to walk away from that one. Kind of a peculiar one. I think the chance of actually killing the Renekton with flash and ultimate were, let's say, low. Probabilities there not really working out, and they're surrendering a lot of pressure around top. They know, for example, that Visitachi would have to use summon spell teleport to come to top, so smart to pull up. And worst comes to worst, you draw a teleport. Best case scenario, you take the turret that's been so hard to set up, and also those control wards, the ones we were saying needed to be taken out, those best control wards are gone because forcing a fight that wasn't going to happen down bot, there's always going to be a reaction. That reaction is pushing up the vision, inching out the turret. The standing gold that's getting very injured and should soon be with Kongru Monster, but frustrating for them, they're not able to actually grow a leader still. It was 100, what, five minutes ago? Yeah. Now it's 400, so about the same. And you, a super important point there with the standing gold is that there has only been one tower taken down so far. The longer into the game we get, the more objectives are available to be taken. When someone does win a team fight, they're going to be looking at at least two towers, so long as it's a convincing victory. And now we're getting towards 20 minutes. Baron is going to start to be on the cards. Dragon hasn't been an objective for either of these teams so far, which, I mean, it's nothing to do with the poor Drake himself. It is a mountain Drake, certainly a valuable objective, but neither team really wanted to focus on that. Well, just because the setups have been exclusively top, Kongdu can't just fall back to the Drake. When you're setting up around bottom mid, you just push your wards and you're like, okay, Drake's free. Because they've been setting up around top side and Baron wasn't a realistic objective, Rift Herald is a very low priority objective, the backup objective hasn't come through, so Drake sits on the Rift, a bit sad, not getting any love. Mountain, one of the most popular ones, but just uh, yeah. not the beautiful swan this time, the ugly duckling, unfortunately, for that Drake. Feeling awfully lonely down in his pond, but... It is weird yep. that we talk about the Drake living longer as lonely. Because when, when he sees <laughs> yeah. friends, they're Actually, never yeah, friends. Probably they're only foes. He's still sat on his pile of gold. He's more than happy at this point. But here we go. Might be a dive coming through here. Exile will walk away. It's about the zoning here. They want the turret. Yeah, and they are going to be able to grab that objective once again. You mentioned it earlier. They dive behind the turret, force it up. Punch and Soul can both chunk towers so, so quickly. But Unicorn's a bit slow to set up. They're going to now look for the dive. There was no pressure around mid, so they know they're finally getting a turret. And certainly a high priority one. This will be first tower of the game for Unicorns. Yeah, two to one in towers now still in favor of Kongdu. But that gold lead once again still very minimal. It's around a thousand for Kongdu. It's gone up ever so slightly, but it's still nothing too ridiculous. The irony is that in any other game, mid turret for top turret win Unicorns of Love. But because they're playing 1-3-1, they'd actually rather have turrets in the long lanes in bottom and top lane to start parking the rise in the side lane. They're actually frustrated that they're playing around their only window of power around the mid lane. So it does sound comical, but Unicorns need to find a way to actually get these side lane pushes they really drafted for happening. And so far, it's been denied by Kongdu Monster. Well, uh, Drake is no longer lonely, but he's also no longer on the Rift. That's going to be one for Kongdu. They get themselves a Mountain Drake, which with how they've been playing so far this game, certainly a useful Drake to have. Having that extra tower damage behind themselves will certainly be a boon in their arsenal. I mean, the ball next to a turret, Dominus popped, Renekton popping around the yeah. back, and then Sivir and Graves get closer and closer, deleting turrets with the AD that will, of course, come along and also the priority they'll have. So like you say, 
happy times in terms of Drake rolls for Kongdu Monster, but it's been a macro game. Some people yeah. are still waiting for blood. They've been told Unicorns of Love have this kills and deaths, but the 25 minute point yeah. that Vettius talked about is coming very, very soon. The calm before the storm. The storm is, uh, we're not quite seeing the storm clouds, but uh, they're not too far away. They're just behind the horizon. But I'd, I'd want to bring attention to the, the CS numbers across the board here, because despite this being a macro game, and despite people swapping lanes a lot, and there's been a lot of kind of switching around to try and get priority on these objectives, there's actually very little differences across the CS numbers. Ever so slightly, there's a 20 CS lead in the mid lane, there's 10 CS lead in the top lane, but nothing nothing really stand out -ish. The reason why that happens is that if you consider how turrets have been taken, they've been repeatedly pushed and someone wave clearing. So they're not getting bonus turrets in any way. And CS is being traded for turret HP. So when you're pushing so aggressively in multiple lanes, someone invariably, like the Varus, is picking up the CS. So sure, Edge has found 20 bonus farm, but like you say, they prioritize getting the standing, standing gold rather than denying gold. Because in a world where Varus exists, it's very hard to deny when he's shooting arrows from off the screen. Yeah, and uh, always a difficult champion to play into. I'm sure you've all played against Tavares in solo queue, and it feels like when if he can get on the front foot, Varus is a terrifying thing to deal with in a siege, and it just feels like two arrows and you have to go back to base. So far, we've not seen that scenario occur in this game. Do you think that's a scenario that UOL are going to be trying to force? Are they going to be looking for the siege here? So or do you think they're going to be looking for picks? You talk about UOL forcing, and that's what they do, right? They get rise, they get globals, let's go in, all in. But the one thing that Unicorns Love don't do is ward. Instant, interestingly, they have by far the lowest warding amount in the EU LCS. And as has always been the way it seems when you compare warding stats, Korea has, I believe, seven teams above the first place team in EU. Korea just naturally places a lot of wards. Kongdu Monster is one of these teams. Without the wards, they're kind of relying on Unicorns, sorry, on Kongdu Monster to walk up and be picked. And so far, it's been Kongdu setting the pace of the game. And even if Unicorns want to make the sick initiation play, it's so risky right now because they haven't gotten anywhere near having the advanced vision to get a safe Rengar ult. Because sure, you can find the person you want to kill, but they don't have information about where the reinforcements are at unless we see a pretty big slip up strategically from Kongdu. So they'd love to fight Unicorns. We're at that point, 25 minutes, 20 yeah. seconds away. But, you know, look at the wards. Okay, red buff spawn, they know about that. Everything else, it's kind of up in the air. I've got to say, I want to talk a little bit about Hillisang here because Hillisang has come into this tournament kind of with this label of playmaker, right? He, sure. Uh, Crumbs was saying it on the desk, he is the guy that is willing to kind of flash forward and force the engage for his team. This game has been awfully quiet, really not going for too much, and I think this is typical. Riftwalk there doesn't actually go through in the end. I think this is typical of the fact that he's playing on that Zyra instead of some of the more aggressive supports that we're used to seeing him on. Oh, oh, Hillisang, goodbye. It turns out yeah, you were writing a eulogy Hillisang. for him there. <laughs> <laughs> now they'll well, walk up. This is the large turret denied from them. This should be the turret for Kongdu. We they keep playing their game. We mentioned the power spikes coming in at about 25 minutes. He's just finished his Ludin's Echo and immediately just pops the support on the spot, grabs themselves the hat trick in towers now. And Kongdu certainly on the front foot. He really wrote a beautiful eulogy for Hillisung as he Rest died to the robot lady. But the big thing that happened this game was blue is tele blue is flash, sorry, early. So laning phase. And to me, it's Hillisung's laning phase where he's like, well, I don't know what's happening on the map, but I'm flash queuing on Thresh. I'm going for the big play. That was kind of denied when you don't have flash. So he's actually had to be pretty defensive when it comes to the pick engage. And then Zyra only really engages when you have a pressure lead, sitting in a pink ward, the enemy support walks up and goodbye, strangle thorns. That hasn't been this kind of game. Zyra's kind of been walking between lanes, helping people wave clear and putting down defensive vision for say example, Samix and the top lane. So for, for now, Hillisang has kind of been an afterthought because the game has been played exclusively at Kongdu Monster's pace. Again, we return to it. The game is still very short lanes in top, in bot. The 1 3 1 so far hasn't happened. So, Kongdu have a decent gold lead, but it's all about the next step. They've got the easy objectives out of turrets, easiest objectives on the rift. It's about, hey, what about the Baron buff setups? What about setting up sieges around the inner turrets? That's the big question is, okay, throw all the hunts popped. Zerxay searching for this a could be big. Here. They're going straight onto Edge. He will be knocked up here. Zerxay get on onto backline. Punch will be stunned up. Everyone solo. Shockwave with though. Zerxay getting away with his life, but Visage actually ain't so lucky. It's Roach. Ruger walks away. Roach looking for the flank here. Already using that Dominus. He's trying to find his way in. 
and I don't think this is a good opportunity for him. Look how much HP Bunch escaped on. Like, it must have been 50 at least. I mean, Guga was a hero flashing on for the Devour on Edge. He doesn't die. He lives to tell the tale. Sure, it's a hula hip on the Shockwave, so that's one to forget for Edge, but it was a disengaging Shockwave. In the end, they buy this pace, and that looked like the epitome of what Unicorns of Love are all about. Armada-esque flash over the Raptors into Stranglethorn, but only hits one person. That person is ejected, yep. and there's no advantage gained, even though a lot was invested by Unicorns of Love. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned the Shockwave from Edge right there. Imagine if it had hit. They already won the fight without that. When we're looking at these next team fights, if he can manage to land that shockwave and they're already winning without it, it's going to be a dominant victory for Kongdu. Second Drake goes their way now, an ocean in the back as well as Hillislang just clearing vision around this Baron because I think he's getting nervous that Kongdu might set their sights on this objective. Yeah, it's going to be difficult though, uh, because the wave clears there, a lot of rotational tools for Unicorns with the Shen ultimate, the Realm Warp, very hard to do any sort of sneaking of something like a Baron. We're going to see the replay and watch the engage of Hellsight. You're like, okay, this is perfect, but it's only on to one member. Tom Kench does the rest, and that ult was purely disengaged. So to answer your question, I don't think they were really going to get a Wombo ult. The Renekton was too far away to profit from it, and the AP values aren't crazy yet. So it looks silly as Edge like, damn it, why did I do that? But in terms of how it affected the game, very minimally is, okay, first objective consequentially yep. here is one down Barters. Roach is also really piled on some items. We haven't been looking at the items recently. It's got a Guardian oh. Angel on top. It's Exile. Exile's in a whole heap of trouble. Does push he gets away. Down. Gets the movement speed from uh, his passive as well. Walks away with that one. I've got to say, didn't think he was going to get away with that. And a lot invested here from Kongdu. Three members up towards the top lane. And you already mentioned the standing goal. Visage actually sweeping up that bottom lane tower. That shrunk the goal gap slightly. If they could somehow find the top tower as well, they will even things up. But that's going to be easier said than done. Definitely some genuine Nikes from the Rise. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Those are not counterfeit. He got the legit ones. He moved so fast without Just Ghost. Like I looked at the Ghost it. and I was like, wait, that's Exhaust. So he opened the space and not able to punish what was a free objective, if you think about it, for Unicorns of Love. Finally getting some purchase for the 1-3-1 they've been denied for so long into the game. Crazy there's only been six kills. Yeah. Had, we've had some teasers. We've had, we've had much more skirmishes than we have actual kills. More many more fights than we've had results from those fights. But UOL certainly looking to change that one, Xerxe has his Thrill of the Hunt available. And the hopeful thing for Unicorns is the items don't get any better for Rush. She's gone for the two damage core of... Oh, wow. UOL Hydra just and Black Cleaver. The start. The Baron They're straight brute forcing away this. They're going for this one. They've got the rise. They hit, they've hit some power spikes. No silver all yet. Kruger gonna walk on forward, trying to zone them away. Chains of Corruption go down. UOL looking for the fight here. Stunt onto Kruger, Kruger's gets the taunt, and they will pick up the kill onto the support. No ultimates really used aside from on the hunt there from the side of KDM, but they lose a player. Good decision making from Unicorns. They knew Teleport was down on Roach. No way for him to react. So wasn't able to walk in. They're not gonna release the Baron. Support dying for denying a Baron is, of course, a very good trade for Kongdu Monster. He has a semi-global to be able to get back there, so we'll get back pretty swiftly now that the Home Guards have been activated. But they tried to make a decisive play. That's the first time Unicorns have really been able to do something decisive for maybe 15, 20 minutes. They pull it off, not quite the maximum purchase, and we kind of reset with no big gains for either side. Yeah, and it, I like that they've kind of changed styles almost of how they're trying, how they're going about forcing these. Instead of it being them engaging, they force the Baron and get engaged. Yeah, we off. see the replay. I mean, there's no way for a Roach to be there, so this is a perfect play from the Unicorns of Love. Guger ends up getting CC down, so the Grey Health doesn't really count for anything. But the crucial fact is it's a pick with no objective at 29 minutes. That never happens almost because there's so many standing objectives like Top Turret, for example, yeah. for Unicorns of Love to pick up. but. The vision keeps being equalized around the Baron. And again, the, the happy place for Unicorns is the items keep getting better for them, and specifically for the Renekton, we're falling off a cliff. There's not really anything you can pile on, apart from a bit more extra armor, to perhaps be the world's best ball carrier for Edge, but that's, that's kind of all he's gonna amount to yeah. once we get a bit further in the game. And even then, he'll struggle against uh, some of the other ball delivery systems in this game. But I've got to say, the supports have not been having a fun time so far this game. Both Hillisang and Gruger have certainly been receiving uh, the butt of the damage coming out from their opponents. Both of them on two kills so far. And I mean, that's a hefty portion of the kills considering 
So I want to talk about a small micro thing. You look on the mini map, and obviously top laners don't have kill potential. It's a bit silly billy in the bot lane. Shen is being super smart here because he's proxying Renekton's waves. And Renekton, sure, is getting an advanced push and vision around the bot, but he's not going to be there to interrupt the stand United. So this is actually strategically a big win for the Shen, who proxied the wave and is now moving towards mid. And this is a nice rotation from Unicorn. Yeah, Unicorn should be able to at least get some damage down onto this tower. Soul using that thrill of the hunt, or on the hunt, I never remember which one's which. But Roach actually coming for a flank here. They're looking to force the fight. There's a chat sheet on this front line, but that's exactly where he wants to be. Will get stunned up. A lot of damage coming on through. Half HP already, but Roach getting traded back onto his next around the side. He's going to use his own ultimate to try and find a re-engage, but I don't think he's going to find anything here. And the thrill of the hunt for nothing. The on the hunt also for nothing. Sadly, we don't have the famous Sivir Rengar duo, the on the thrill of the hunt. My favorite. Uh, on the thrilling hunt. On the thrill of the hunt's a fun. Duo ultimate, and obviously a lot of synergy, giving extra movement speed to the, to the Rengar, but not to be this time. So a lot of duo about nothing once again. Seven kills in 33. Yeah, it's been a slow burner for both of these teams, which, you know, we didn't expect from Unicorns coming into this tournament. We were expecting them to come in with a bang, not pulling any They're punches. just happy this doesn't count as their EU LCS stats, like they can still have the most kills per death. Kill, kills and deaths per minute, because uh, this is uh, I am, so it doesn't count. They're happy about that. Realm Warp. Just teased. Not going to actually go in. KDM trying to bait this, trying to force this fight. Roach charging on forwards. Will be slowed down slightly. UL on the wrong side of this fight. It's going to be a huge ultimate. Roach on the front line. Gets chucked so heavily. Has to flash away. Arrow through onto a few of them. Xerxes there. This redemption will heal up these members. Roach not feeling quite so dead at it. this point. Edge gets caught up. Cleanses immediately though. Chains of Corruption onto Gruga. No taunt lands though. This has been such a tense We're being fight teased, but we're sides. so close to a fight much. There's a Chachi, he wants the taunt if he can find any of the carries. Get Big onto Sol, flash. nice flash. Jumps in with the Rengar as well, but Sol survives somehow. Visit Chachi just about getting away with his life. Guardian Angel pops. Is no one gonna Edge die? So low. Exile on the front line now. Needs to be careful how close he gets because Roach wants the stun if he can find it. Bola goes down. Exile just getting as much damage as he can onto the crocodile. Nobody goes down. Insane that no one dies there. Really nice turn. Soul got DPS, but then got Tom Kench. And I thought, okay, now Kongnu are going to be short of damage. They won't be able to win the fight, but so close to the re-engage. And we continue to be teased. Second Mountain Drake. You get vision control around this Baron. Doesn't really matter what your comp is. We know that there's a lot of consistent damage yeah. from Kongdu. The Baron turn is getting scarier and scarier as Double Mountain Drake is confirmed. Yeah, and now, like, I feel like going back to the storyline of, you know, Europe versus Korea, this kind of answer. Oh, it's all the, in time. Oh, here we go. Rushing the Baron actually looking to take an objective. They've seen that they lost the Drake. They're going for one bigger. They want to one up their They're opponents. They're going to be too late, I think. 4,000 HP. This should be taken away here. Get the smite. They yes, look for they a fight. Baron taken, but the fight will ensue. Shockwave only onto Exile, but he might just go down. Sol getting chased away by Visit Chachi. The AD carry not going to be there. Edge so close. Beautiful little consume there by Gruger. Keeps his mid laner alive. And once again, we have a deathless fight. But the MVP, the VIP does die. That is the Baron. There was a really nice Realm Walk play by Exile. Another decisive Baron call. The one when Roach was out of position with no teleport. Got them a fight that didn't lead to anything. This one gets them the Baron objective against the run of play. They still don't have top outer turret down because of how much has been denied. But now it should be pretty easy. It's going to be plenty of time for Shen to take this. The objectives start to fall. The gold lead is now there for Unicorns. And while we've seen very close shaves in previous fights, I think everyone has noticed Renekton frustrated with rune prisons, with all manner of disengage. It's level 18 time. The yeah. Renekton is going to really struggle, barring the best possible ball delivery. Now we get to the true 1-3-1. One, one. The Unicorns have been denied for 36 minutes. Yeah, and now it's a question of how how much effect can they have in this couple of minutes that they'll have from Baron? How much can they pull out of this objective? And how much can they really punish Kongdu for losing out on that fight and not being able to punish them? Here's that fight once again. Again, most of this fight is actually about the setup. The setup for this is really smart from Unicorns. They see Mountain Drake come down, they know the recall, they see Renekton casually pushing minions in the bot lane. They make the Realm Walk play, it works out, and the fact that no one dies is not an important factor this time. Sure for the excitement factor, but really nice rotational play from Unicorns of Love. Not necessarily something you always say, but really good decisive stuff from them. 
Hasn't been the decisive team fight kills, it's been the decisive objective players that have really helped Unicorns. Red buff, I think, stolen away there by Xerxes. I think he got the smite in the end. But KDM, for the first time this game, actually on the back foot. They're the ones but it's now a, defending. It, it's a big back foot for much yeah. That's what we need to talk about is, you, know, you talked about, okay, what's the Baron power play gonna look like? Finally, the side lanes have opened, and now it's the 1-3-1. that has been so well stopped by Kongdu, and there's not a lot of answers for Kongdu. They can group, they can try and force them, they can look for a dive. Zyra can answer dive. A lot of disengaged CC exists for Unicorns of Love. And if the game is played now, finally, at the pace of Unicorns, Kongdu's comp doesn't really have an answer. So we talked about, can they translate into enough of an advantage? The three outer turrets, very good speed. If they were the ones to get the Baron, the answer would have been yes. But now, it's getting more and more feeling like the answer was no. Yeah, it's starting to feel less and less even. The minion wave will not be cleared away in time. And oh, the tower doesn't go down. One more auto would have done it. 37 HP. Shouldn't be too much of an issue. They will be able to just come back to that objective again in the future. But just a little bit of a kick in the teeth for the Unicorns. Safety first from the Unicorns of Love. No longer playing high kill death games, no longer playing very short games. Getting closer and closer to the point where Shen can ignore this damage and Natasha's getting turned on by three, but is it going to be enough? He doesn't seem to mind that much. We'll flash over the wall eventually. We'll have his shadow dash up again available soon, so he's going to be perfectly fine on that one. Knew that his laners were on the way as well, so he didn't have to back too far away. Doesn't want to completely concede pressure in that jungle. And now all Kongdu can really hope to get the 5v5 manly fight they want is to fight around an Elder Drake, is to fight around a Baron, because this map is being very well split by Unicorns. Yeah, the Stay at seven, and until we see a, a major objective, both teams decide to opt into a fight around, it's probably going to stay at seven, which was. Minions finish off that mid lane tower, so the standing gold starting to go now in favor of Unicorns. They finally have a tower objective, and it's the exact same score as we've got in kills here. Four to three on both. The gold lead, it is 2,000 gold. Obviously, it is the lead for Unicorns, but in terms of the monetary value of that 2,000 at 40 minutes into the game, it's basically negligible. However, this advantage that we're looking at isn't about the gold. And that's the thing. It's kind of one of those weird math equations where you're like, what is the efficiency of items on a Renekton at level 18 this late in the game? It's almost like you're not getting full value for your gold. Like one gold is worth 0.6 or something yeah. because the items don't really out out amp the power. Whereas Vizichachi continues to get stronger. May even finally get some AD. Couldn't afford Titanic. Oh, he has the Titanic Hydra. Maybe it's going to be more health and armor then. But still going to get tankier. So there's a split push threat. So it's an, a larger implied gold lead in the top. But then you're like, okay, Orianna versus Rise. Hard to say if it's a 1-3-1, one, one, certainly Rise. If it's a team fight, certainly Orianna. We're getting to really weird territory. The only factor we haven't talked about, six items Sivir. It is yeah. a very scary thing to play against. We're sitting at four, one item short of that six item phase. If we get the team fight that now Kongdu is desperate for, maybe that will be the factor. But if it keeps being played 1-3-1, one, one, there's just not much Kongdu can do. And they're watching objective after objective fall down and they really don't have an answer across the map to answer it. And I mean, you mentioned if they get the team fight that they need, Soul is going to be a huge factor in trying to find that team fight as well. But again, one of the down, one of the pitfalls of picking that Renekton is, yes, you're super tanky, but he doesn't really have any consistent hard engage. It's all down to this bottom lane to actually find these fights. And it's one of those things where you set up around Elder Drake, put down three control wards and force people to face check. Maybe Kongdu's comp works, but it's you get worried when it's one, two, three, four things you have to consider. Okay, we've got a theater of battle. They've leashed the Drake, or the Dragon, I should say. It's down to 7,000. Hongdu have to back away, but they really want to turn around and fight also. Yeah, they really want this, but UOL might just be gifted a Drake on a platter. 4,000, they should Big be able to get Big Spangle They're going to rush down. Thorns, knocking everyone up. It really is. already so low on HP, the Drake. Getting incredibly low, will be finished off by the Unicorns, and this is surely their fight with that buff on their back. Salt getting away with his life. Shockwave only on to visit Chachi there. It's not enough to take a fight, and they have to back away. Now Realm Walk, Roach has got nowhere to go. He's found himself in between four players. Will be finished off. It's a fifth kill on the board, but importantly, the Elder Dragon. The early shot calls were so good for Kongdu, but they pulled too far back. Smart from Hillasung. He actually made probably the big play of this game, just using Strangle Thorns to clog up the territory. No way to follow through. Even Sivra with the movement speed wasn't enough to get them the fight where they maybe it would have been able to take 5v5. 
Elder Drake is now denied. Remember, there's actually no Drake buffs for Unicorns of Love. So it's more of a denial on this situation. And maybe you get a chance to set up around Baron. But it's worrying that Kongdu had that spip call, backed away, tried to come in, didn't get the fight they're looking for. And the biggest advantage they get is that, okay, no Flash on Exile and Hillsung for the next fight because they respect Flash the Shockwave. But Baron's going to be started right now by Unicorns of Love. And this is probably the last time for Kongdu to get a 50-50 fight. Yeah, and honestly, like, even with this Dragon buff, it's going to be difficult for Kongdu to actually force this fight. Sivir's not there. It will be available for Vizichachi. As you say, Soul not here right now. Yoel well actually back in a way. They want the fight here. Edge is going to get consumed by Groove. He can't escape. Flashes over the wall. Zerxate chasing this one, but he's all alone. Shockwave gets avoided. Redemption healing up the KDM members. And once again, we have yet another fight that's just disengaged. Yeah, the disengage is so strong on both sides. Flashes had to be used. Unicorns are trying again. They know Shockwave is down. About a 30 second cooldown. Not that long this late in the game. But no vision. Okay, some spot vision. They know Baron's at 50%. I don't think Kongdu can watch this go down, or I don't see how they win the game. Roach will get locked up here. He's trying to get to the fight, but he, got so it. he gets the steal! What a play! Samux trades it for a kill. Can they turn it into more? Unicorns have to punish this one. Edge will be going down on the Souls back line out of the fight. Kruger drops as well. Roach pulls himself to safety with the blast cone. Soul also walking away, but there's only two members up right now for Kongtu. Can they even wave clip? Oh, too many people had to walk up to give Punch even a chance of the 50 50. Nice smite from him, but five members strong here. And Roach is there as a bodyguard, but Soul can't walk up to wave clip and take some sick damage as well. So, still going to lose objectives despite Sivir being very healthy. Yeah, it was a valiant effort from Punch, but not enough to They might try and end the game objectives. here, Munchables. Yeah, 30 seconds still on edge, 20 on Punch. They can force this one if they want to, or they can at least try. Going to keep the pressure on, but deciding this isn't going to be the end of the game just yeah. yet. It's going to be a double minion wave because the, they were both leash onto the minions being pushed in mid. Both of them Baron buffed up, so probably smart to move away. Does extend the game. Well, Punch was looking for a moment. Had a nice early game, and then had some vision. If you notice, the vision in the corner isn't actually cancelled out by where the control world was put down. So it wasn't a complete guess. It was an informed decision by Roach. But look at how many, so by Punch, but look how many other people had yeah. to walk up for even there to be enough pressure for Graves to dash over. So multiple people die. They still lose an objective. They get to the Baron, and the Baron going down would have been the death knell for Kongdu Monster. But while it's not a death knell, they're now mortally wounded with the mid lane inhibitor down. Slowly but surely bleeding out, but. Now it's front door time. They've got to go in. They can't allow this game to be a 1-3-1. One, one. They kind of just need to ride a minion wave, get the shock wave of all time, and just try and rush down the game because they're being split and drawn to multiple sides of the map, which shouldn't happen with Baron buff, but that's the world Shen lives in. And one of the things we were talking about right at the start of the game was the fact that Kongdu were ahead in the tower trade. So they managed to get three towers when Unicorns only had one. Well, they're still, still just on those three towers. Unicorns now on six with an inhibitor to boot. That, that small advantage they had early on is but a shadow of itself. It's just such a crazy game, because what was it? 3-1 in kills, three turrets down at 18, 20 minutes? 25 minutes later, five kills on yeah. one side, two on the other, and some, and some turrets. And so it's been remarkably bloodless, especially for Unicorns of Love series. But I think this is the sort of match where, you know, Deficio, other analysts at home are going to be watching Unicorns be like, hmm. Very yeah. controlled, very smart around the Barons in terms of the nice Hillasang just clogging the chokes with this new pick, at least for him. The Zyra that he's looked past so far this season. It's been ordered stuff from Unicorns. Good bossing around by Kongdu in the early game, but Unicorns never went for the risky all-in team fights. They just tried to react where they could. Great movements around Baron. Now they're ahead at 46, but do we have that one fight? Kongdu are praying that taking that Baron will lead to a fight that isn't just them being split around the map, but it's no guarantee. As in the bot lane, Shen having a fun time with Renekton, but we're going to be focused on seeing if anyone wants to get frisky around the inner top turret for Kongdu Monster. Yeah, but we're getting to the point in the game where if Samix can just land two arrows onto someone like Edge or Punch in these fights, they immediately just have to bail. They have to get out of their ASAP. And I've got to say, talking about UOL's like, typical playstyle versus how they're playing here. You have to assume that it's to some extent respect of the Korean opponents. You know, we've talking, we're talking, we've spoken at length about the fact that you know we've had a lot of length to speak about. We have had a 47 lot of minutes with not a lot of kills, but they 
certainly are looking at these Korean opponents, and everyone's been semi-unsure as to how these teams will match up. And I think UOL respecting that and saying, okay, let's play this slow, let's not do anything uh, let's not do anything risky, and let's play this to our strengths. I mean, this is like the title match I was hoping for in the first round, but it's like I've been misled. This yeah. is not the unicorns that the VODs or other analysts led me to believe. It's been actually a lot more strained unicorns, a lot slower unicorns. And while that hurt them in the early game, the fact that they could be so smart in the mid to late, even if it's not just see hero get the big fight, is really cool to see. And they're still even at more ahead than 6,000 gold at this point suggests. So it will take some sort of titanic engage for Kongdom Monster to actually turn this one. Chains of Corruption, but nothing really going to follow up on that one. It's just to zone and grab that tower. That is going to be the seventh now. UOL, they've eliminated all objectives outside of KDM's base. And Shen in the bot lane ignores very much both turrets and Renekton's damage. So every time a minion wave exists, he takes objectives. Uh, he's probably getting closer and closer and inching towards the bot lane inhibitor. And now suddenly it gets very hard to send members because you kind of need to send Sivir to wave clear fast enough against the Shen, but super minions are spawning. So obviously she is being called into mid lane. Top is being incrementally pushed. You throw out an, a short cooldown ultimate like the Chains of Corruption that we know will be up very soon and you get the objective you're looking for. Again, we talked about easy objectives for Kongdu being out of turrets. With how this game has gone, all the easy objectives are now down for the Unicorns of Love. Yeah. Much harder to brute force down and inhibit a turret. All outer objectives are down. Baron in 1 minute 35. Yeah. Will that actually be enough pressure for Kongdom Monster to actually look for anything more than just a chance steal by the Graves? Well, that's the question. We've been mentioning how they they do want to try and find these fights. They can't afford to just stay nope. in this 1-3-1 one, one situation. There's no They've more free objectives to give happen. up. Exactly. They've given up the maximum. And now with Baron on the cards, this could be kind of the the final redeeming factor for them. If they can pull that Baron off, they could win a fight there. They are very much still in this game. The inhibitor will be respawning shortly. In fact, it has respawned to Xerxes. Bouncy castle for Xerxes. That, that, that was peanut esque. That yeah. was peanut esque. <laughs> That's a good man to take a nod from most of the time. Not so yeah. much with that. But now UOL very aware of the Baron timing here, stepping into this side of the jungle, making sure that they have vision prepared, making sure that they're ready for that eventuality. Vizzy Chachi still down in that bottom, but <laughs> just chipping away with Roach. I mean, that's just one of these endless fights that's been going on all game. And You call it a fight. That's <laughs> yeah. kind of kind of generous. It looks Let's like spar. he's got a really big weapon. It looks like Shen is doing some damage surgically, I guess, in this it's game. It's one of those foam weapons that you can buy at concerts. They should definitely just, at this point in the game, when it's Shen versus Renekton, they should sub in the Taipei Assassin skin for the Shen and just have Thundersticks. Yeah. That's what it is there. It's, we're getting some very dull weapons between both Roach and Vizicharch. You would think that with, oh yeah, this is interesting. So he actually swapped out Titanic Hydra for Ravenous Hydra, which is intriguing given that's normally an early game move. Zerxay. All right, Zerxay wants Edge. That's the easiest person to take down. If it can find him, it'll be phenomenal, but Garuga is just waiting for that to happen so he can consume his mid laner. But look at the pressure this is called. Ult for ult. No relation of the Rengar ult taking Baron. Sivir ult being down. Another denial by Hillisang. They're going to have to brute force this one. It must be low. 5,000 HP on the Baron. Here we go. The smite is going to be crucial. Can Punch even get near? The answer is no. Baron taken by the Unicorns, and now they are looking to fight. Look how low Edge is. That's just the sheer pressure. But well, you can calm down, Munchables. They ain't got no more CC from range, so everyone's going to back away. No more They're kills. They're trying to find it, but once again, the disengage from this team is just... They, they, they just walk away from every single... I mean, the only option they had was a Realm Warp, which was down anyway, so... No Party Warp. No more kills, just the Baron dying again. Mountain Drake somehow avoided death, but Baron buff, not so lucky. And we reset. We're yeah. back to resetting. We're just, you know, we're getting to a zen place. This time, though, the Unicorns have got a Baron buff. So when we go back to, when we reset, that got, puts us in the 1-3-1, one, one, and with a Baron buff to They're going to have an out. Elder Drake buff, too, because it's a bit too risky for Kongnu Monster to walk through no vision against this team, so... I mean, we've literally just seen what happens when Kongdu try and contest objectives like this. They can't get anywhere near. Not even going to try on this one, just going to concede this entirely. And with both the Baron and the Elder Dragon, this is looking like a terrifying Unicorns, and it might just be all that's required to finish this one out. Yeah, like we said before, I'm sorry we don't have a Drake timer, a Drake tracker, but there are no Drakes for Unicorns. It's just double Elder Dragon for them, so 
Not the maximum value, but certainly more on top of Baron buff already. We're waiting to see if Kongdu gets that fight that they're still praying for. I think this time, maybe they're asking for too much. There's a lot on the Unicorns of Love between items and also the buffs. So 52 minutes in, yeah. Kongdu can't afford to give up any more free objectives, but you can understand the back lane now with Edge chunked out. This should be mid lane inhibitor for Unicorns of Love. Yet another string to their bow right now. 52 minute game. What a match here. Soul taking down to half damage. HP there. And that's the power of that Elder Dragon buffing him up, getting that extra burn damage. Second inhibitor goes down. UOL are looking to finish this one out. Now, if they want, they can rotate up towards the top lane or they can just wait for these supers and look to end. We'll see. They're very strong. They're very shocked. We're getting six item territory, so buying stuff. Isn't actually that val valuable. I think Xerxes will get his sixth item now. Yep, there's Guardian Angel. Triple Guardian Angel, Shen, Rise, and Rengar. Well, don't even need buffs now, Munchables. It's dive time. Uh, you got these many items. There isn't that much disengage barring the Shockwave. And the Shockwave looks like it's going to be intimidating with those items, but you're so tanky on Unicorns of Love that you just have Rise, Rengar, and Shen move as fast as possible at Orianna, force her to Shockwave them. And then you just kind of win the fight with the pieces from there. So this should finally be the ending push. A lot to say. Yeah. Pre-60 minutes is the dream here for Unicorns of Love. They've inched forward and forward and forward. There's no more inching. They just have to end the game. Yeah, the siege begins once again. But Samix actually using Chains of Corruption. Kruger going to sacrifice his own movement speed to pick up Edge and pull himself to safety. But this is surely going to be an inhibitor. I mean, do Kongdu need to just force this fight just to stay in the game? Uh, forcing, I think, was a couple of objectives ago. Yeah. That's the sad thing is they weren't allowed to force because the setups were so clean by Unicorns of Love in the latter half of this game, post 25, 30 minutes. I was in the control of Kongdu. And again, at the earlier part, you remember what I said. If they can keep the pressure on, take turrets, rotate, have a unique vision, they can play this game quickly and end the game. But now it's Renekton late game. Now it's the 1-3-1. One, one. And they just don't have the tools for one. They don't have things to punish. Renekton can't punish any one single target CC, not doing relevant damage. Orianna isn't going to be able to walk up and ult someone. She's not going to be flanking anybody. And Sivirolt is very transparent and will be easily disengaged from, from Unicorn. So without an Ash, without ranged initiation, they've been split and split and split. And what you should take away from this game is how controlled Unicorns have been. There has never been the cold rush of blood to the head. There's never been one of those H2K moments like, wait, why are you doing this? It's been ordered so much by Unicorns. And now 55 minutes in, inhibitors down. Can they find a way to end the game and end the misery of Kongdu Monster? Because they're, they're powerless. They're powerless. They, powerless. Are, they they're, can't do for anything. The last, for the last, what, 25 minutes, they've just been waiting for things to happen. They've just been waiting for Unicorn to put the foot down. Now with three inhibitors down, Supers pouring into every single lane. This will surely be the final fight and the end of the game. UOL already getting onto... Oh, oh nice flash from Samix. Dodges away from the Shockwave here. Towers slowly but surely getting chipped on down. Triple Torque coming out from Visit Chachi. Nice bit of play from him. He goes down into his Guardian Angel, though. Good fight from KDM so Take far. The next road turret. gets taken up there. Will get the one. first tower in the end. Health bars are fairly low for UOL, aside from Xerxes and Samix there. Looking for Soul, but not able to find the kill. Once again, top It'd be fitting if play. they got the Nexus with no one dying. Yeah, they're looking for this one. Just trying to finish things off. Visit Chachi gets his stand united, gets into the fight. Got, finally, the, the Guardian Angel popped from Exile, but the Nexus is slowly but surely falling. Edge goes down to a piercing arrow. And that is going to be the match going the way of the Unicorns. And certainly not in the fashion that we expected but showing that they can play the late game. They can play for Mac. Expectations are always so tricky in a best of one versus teams that play in very different regions, but the scouting report was wrong for Unicorns of Love. Their play around objectives in the mid to late game, Hillisung especially, so many times. Oh, you're coming through a choke with Silver Ultimate? Strangle Thorns. Yeah. Multi-man on the E on the stun, and it was really, really well done by Unicorns of Love, who problem solved them out of a whole. Kongdu were getting what they wanted in the early game. They were rotating, they were smart, but there was that moment where you're like, wait, they haven't gotten anything in a while. And from there, the game was played near flawlessly by Unicorns of Love. Really nice macro execution from them. It wasn't a super exciting game. If you're looking for the kills, if you're an LPL viewer, you'll be a bit sad with how this game ended up.
But as someone like myself who can appreciate clean macro, there was a lot of clean macro from Unicorns especially. Yeah, and like looking at when you when you see a team like Unicorns, you want to herald these like unique players. So many of these players, big personalities and, and big players when it comes to the Rift itself. But in this game specifically, there wasn't really one specific standout player. We had across the board from Unicorns this solid composition. And I think, honestly, the draft was a huge part. So long as they could wait until this late stage of the game, then the draft was phenomenal. It was one of those weird drafts, though, where you're like, okay, if Kongdu Monster just hit all their spikes and win, you're like, nice draft from Kongdu, well played. Yeah. But it's, just, it's the exact counter opposite here for when we talk about Unicorns. They recognize their draft, what the enemy had, and the early game they got dictated to. It changed in a moment. It kind of like a drop of time. The Baron take the really nice rotation from the rise. From that first Baron, Kongdo were never given a chance to get into the game. And that's, that's what should be celebrated. Macro victory, MVP to macro. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Just give someone the MVPs, Daylo around. Who, whoever's sure. shot calling gets that one. But a phenomenal play coming out from Unicorns. And again, as we've said a couple of times throughout this cast, Impressive macro from them. Not something that they're renowned for, not something we're used to seeing, and something that has been brought into question. Absolutely proving that they can pull that out of the bag. And almost an hour long game for their first match here at IEM. Not what we were expecting. I mean, all, all I'm going to say as a last moment is that if you're the next opponent for the Unicorns yeah. Love, you're looking at your notes and being like, just ripping them up. Yeah. Like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what to expect. And that's always the case. They play Warwick, they played crazy picks. Uh, now they play crazy standard. And that should be celebrated. That's international play in a nutshell, right? But we are ready on stage with our winners. So let's see how the Unicorns are feeling off their first victory. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I am joined by Visit Chachi. Now, I think the first question for, for me and maybe for many Unicorns fans out there was what changed between when we saw you in EU LCS and on the stage today to have such, I guess, an unbloody game, such a clean game to come out? Uh, it was basically because uh, we had the game plan coming into the game and... Uh, we already failed to execute it kind of from the lanes because we expected to get ahead uh, mid and bot lane and then we can just keep diving them uh, bot side. But that didn't happen, so it was way harder for us to make any kind of plays and they were kind of in control of the game after they got the first bot turret. So we were forced to kind of play a defensive style and uh, that's why it uh, was very low on kills and yeah. It was a bit harder to play against them because they played a lot of macro-oriented style and uh, didn't contest objectives that much. It was interesting to see. Now tell me, what were the communications like on the team when you had to adapt, when you realized that you were behind and you couldn't kind of play the game like you wanted to play it? Um, we felt like our team composition was stronger in the late game, so we called that we can just uh, do this farm-up game because uh, Varus will be able to poke them out late game and they won't be able to contest the objectives. And I think that worked out well and everyone just got a bit more uh, disciplined after this and uh, went for the plan. My final question is, of course, we're seeing G2 versus Flash Wolves coming up next. A potential contender up against you guys in the winner's bracket. Which team would you rather face uh, and why? Mm, I would love to face G2 again, actually, just to have a rematch from uh, last week's EULCS. Um, I also think they are sl a slightly better team, probably, than the Flash Wolves, although it's going to be two different styles clashing against each other. So it's going to be interesting to see. But I personally expect G2 to come ahead and... Uh, we can face them again for a rematch. All right, well, I would be excited to see that. We'll see how that match unfolds as we move forward in the day. But for more on that series overall, we're going to send it over to the analyst desk to break that one down. Thank you very much, Dracos, on stage there with Unicorns of Love. So I want to bring this right back to the draft phase because, Vedius, you said to me straight off the bat, Draft phase is kind of where it all started for Unicorns of Love. Well, I think we have to look at this Zyra pick in particular, right? Because it's not something that the Unicorns typically draft towards. It's not something that's really, they brought out in the LCS so far. And when I had a chance to talk to Sheep, he said, well, we could have gone for more of our style where we lock in the Tom Kench, maybe look to make a couple plays. But we felt like when you look at the team fight comp and the engaged possibilities that uh, Kongju had brought out, Zyra just made a lot more sense. And we saw throughout the game a number of great ultimates where he was just able to completely disengage and prevent Kongdu from actually starting a lot of those fights. And prevention is the name of that game because not a whole lot happened for <laughs> the later stages of the game. But the beginning was so impressive. There was some, a couple of plays that were really just, wow, that was really good to watch. But the, the lack of engage that Kongdu brought out and the counter-engage picks such as Zyra that 
Unicorns had just made that game such a lull back and forth. And as as Mr. Chachi mentioned, they felt like they were completely like they were not in control of that game, which indicates to the reason why you saw 50-50 Barons. The game stalled out. They wanted to go for dives in the bottom side. They never really got that ball rolling. So it felt like the plan that they had didn't go their way. And whatever plan they wanted to do just felt uncomfortable against the likes of Conduit and we saw that game stall out to almost an hour. So we actually have a replay from about 8 minutes 50 into the game that bottom lane dive attempt, the potential force on the tier 1 turret for Unicorns of Love completely turned around was an excellent sequence of plays from Kongdu Monster and that's I feel where Vivisachi was saying you know I think this is where it went wrong for us. And, and we, we can see that they just lost all pressure from that turnaround in the bottom The thing lane. is, the setup from the Unicorns of Love was actually very promising, right? Because they got themselves two kills. They knew exactly what they wanted to do by playing towards bot side. If they get that first turret, then they set up nicely for the split push later on into the game. But then Kong do come up with a really good counterplay. Exactly. You see them go stay in the bottom lane. They're obviously pushing for that four man. And Kong do can respond with a top lane turret. But there's no jungler here. So they immediately decide we need to defend this turret and go with it all our Renekton pops the Dominus right away. And what it looks like the play might stop right here. The speed up from Orianna and the flash from Renekton here onto the Zera. Look at that. Flash Shockwave. That is such a beautiful combination. And the aftermath is that they get the first brick. They get control of that game. And that was a really assertive play that, as you heard in the cast, not a whole lot of teams will go for that. And the fact that they did it put them in the driver's seat for that early to mid game, which was really impressive to see. And Vivichachi said, that's where we kind of lost our momentum. We were expecting to consistently dive, consistently rotate, take turret and turret and turret, and suddenly Kongdu Monster put a massive spanner in the works and said, hold on a minute, we're, we're not going to let that happen. And then we got this lull that happened for a large portion of the game. The thing is, the risk that you have if you're the Unicorns of Love is if you ever fight into that composition, there's a very high chance that you'll lose because we already talked about how difficult it is for Kongdu to engage, especially into a Zyra. So if they ever contest a Drake, if they ever try and force a tower, there's a high risk that they're just going to get collapsed upon and fall apart. So they just have to play this slow, drawn-out game where they have to concede a lot of objectives until they eventually get to a point where they can outscale. And speaking of the team fights, so many were so close, you know, inch nail biters between people dying. And we actually have one from about 35 minutes into the game, which is that Baron fight. And you see that zoning from uh, Hillisang on that Zara. You see how close it can be and, and how it's so controlled from both teams, not even just Unicorns of Love. Kongdu Monster were incredibly controlled in their team fight play as well. So controlled that nobody ended up dying because they were just so key on the target. Too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much control. Too much control. <laughs> Too much control. But we have, a, we, we have a replay of it here of that Baron fight. This is where things started to wind up for Unicorns of Love, They where they start to take that first Baron. 35 minutes into the game, as we were talking about, is when the Unicorns turn on, but it was a really good setup play from the Unicorns to just force this Baron and realize that, hey, we need to make something happen. They uh, There was a previous fight just before this where a lot of ultimates and a lot of wards were cleared out from the Unicorns, and they realized that we can just go for this. Really good use of the Realm Warp from Exile to be able to force it, and they get themselves a really nice objective. Exile should have died in that, however, he, should have, he yeah. should have died, and it just felt like the game to me felt like Unicorns got really scared off of the first replay that we saw. That was a fantastic play for Kamdu, but you can't replay that play time and time again. You have Shen Ultimate, which is a shorter cooldown than the teleport. You can make that dive onto the bottom side. Just go for Time Kent a million times over. You have the Zyra, the Sivir will not do a whole lot, and they just slowed themselves down, thinking that perhaps that play would happen again. when. Honestly, the play is really difficult to do in the first place. It required two flashes, a teleport, a really great setup, a, kind of a counter gank. And if they just kind of stuck to the plan and said, okay, understand why it went wrong the first time, we can pull it off again one more time. We have our ultimates back up, and we just kind of saw that not happen. I mean, we, hell, we could have even seen Rengar with Shen ulti go straight to Orianna middle, take that turret, which was about one or two hits away from dying, and crack the game wide open. But this is also the risk of best of ones, right? When you do fall under that ever so slight early uh, deficit. I mean, how much but, risk? Just yeah, win. but I mean, you have to bear in mind, like, hey, they're behind this team fighting team. They realize the strength of Kongdu very early on into the game, and they realize that, I mean, you heard Chachi say, they knew they outscaled, right? So why did they need to make this play when they had the, the availability of the 1-3-1? One, one? Yeah, they but I mean, I feel like Baron. at some point, you, you have to take the, you have to take I mean, the I understanding, agree. like, you just know that you have your ultimate and you trust yourself to be able to make that play happen, which was a part that was frustrating for me watching that the, they slowed down so tremendously where they could have aggressed and really capitalized when there was vision available for plays to be made. It is best of one, so we can't really, as you said, we can't just completely 
disregarded them so far because if they play a little bit more assertively in the next series, then all of this is for nothing. It definitely feels like tempo has become a huge part of League of Legends games right now. When that tempo is lost by the team looking to control it, you kind of have to reset everything. However, we're going to cut here on the analysis of this game, and we're going to go into a short break. When we come back, we'll have G2 versus Flash Wolves. It is going to be a very close set of affairs. Make sure you stick around. That great health. We are going to see the Rengar jump in and just obliterate that health bar. First one goes down. Soul is not long for the ring as well. They're trying to finish the Flash and Roach. Big oh, man. Shockwave. Look at the damage coming through. Can they finish it? Only one kill onto Hill. It's like not enough to take a fight. And they have to back away. Now Realm Walk. Roach has got nowhere to go. He's found himself in between four players. Roach will get locked up. He's trying to get to the fight. But he, he, got it. Like, he gets the steal. What a play. Samux trades it for a kill. Can they turn it into more? Nexus is slowly but surely falling. Edge goes down to a piercing arrow. And that is going to be the match going the way of the 